Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element, with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. We're here today to talk about food safety at home um, with my guest. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Wright, and um, I'm a chef for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, and I run my own global event business and catering business. Wow. Um, that's um, so interesting. So where in the world do you head? Well, it all depends on the contract. I've recently been in uh, Dubai working on the World Expo, um, and then Prior to COVID uh, attacking us all, we did the Rugby World Cup in Tokyo. Um, so I get to spend a long time in, in places. I've done several Olympic Games and Commonwealth Games around the world as well. And uh, yeah, it is a pretty exciting lifestyle. That's so cool, like going to see all the athletes and like feeding them. Well, yeah, feeding uh, you know, elite athletes is, ve is very complex, you know, especially with 200 countries uh, participating. Yeah, there's a lot of ethnic and um, you know, different sports, all have different dietary requirements mm -hmm. and a lot of allergens and things like that. But look, food safety is very important as well. Feeding athletes, could you imagine you know, a food poisoning outbreak in an athlete's village? It, you would never work again, I don't think. Oh, <laughs> can you imagine if the Olympics was postponed because all the athletes were sick? Uh, no, oh, I wouldn't want to be responsible that for that. That would be awful. No, absolutely not. Mm. So we'll um, start off with um, a little segment we call, Have You Met Peter? Um, so um, what is your favorite book? Well, favorite book, um, I would say several. The Shining was probably the scariest book I've ever read. And look, in the last few years, mostly I read is uh, books about business or, or um, you know, self-development, things like that. But I recently read The Blue Ocean Strategy, which I found quite fulfilling as a, as a business book, which was um, you know, all about uh, new horizons and things like that. Um, and uh, what about a movie that you really like? Well, I like Groundhog Day because that seems to be my life. And uh, you, know, you, do, you work in the event industry and you plan and plan and plan to do a great event. And then you do the event and it's finished and you're just so relieved that it's over. But then you go and do it all again. So, um, you know, those sort of old quirky comedy movies I quite like. Um, I recently watched two episodes of Harry Potter on the flight back from Dubai. So, you know, a little bit of nostalgia there as well. Mm, it's been a while since I've watched the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, I liked the first couple when they were really little for some reason. They're so cute then. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, are there any podcasts that you listen to? Well, I do, and uh, I like Tim Ferriss. He has some great, uh, great people on his show. You know, it's sometimes a little, it's a little bit too commercial, but I was I'm really fascinated in the life of um, Arnie Schwarzenegger for some reason, and being you know feeding athletes and things like that. And and um, I used to do a bit of work with with bodybuilders. Um, we did a TV show called Muscle TV and things, and sports nutrition and stuff. And his life is very, very interesting. But there's a great interview where Tim Ferriss interviews Arnie Schwarzenegger uh, leading up to being the governor of California. And it's a, it's, he's had a very, very interesting and great life and uh, very inspiring for someone who had nothing to become so great and then to go on to even be greater. So, you know, very interesting podcast. Mm. Do you watch those? Um, my partner watches these. Do you watch those like um, what athletes eat in a day videos? Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm quite I'm quite interested in anything that can help me. I mean, if when you're trying to create a menu, we call it the world menu for, um, yeah, and and we have sometimes sixteen thousand athletes in a village, in a restaurant that holds five thousand six hundred people, which is open twenty four hours a day and it's all free. So you can do up to fifty or sixty thousand meals a day. 
So anything, any advice that we can learn or or get out of those um, those sort of things, it, it sort of adds to the to the value for the next one. Mm. Um, do you have? Oh, I suppose you've already talked um, a role model. Oh, I have several role models. A, lo a lot of them politicians, and um, you know, big businessmen make lots of money, and the democratic world is run by people that aren't paid a lot of money. Um, mostly what they do is criticised in one way or another. So it's a very sort of thankless job in a way. Um, so getting it right is very, very important for all of us because it, you know, it, it guides our lifestyle and our, you know, our sort of community. But, um, you know, I think in general, great politicians, um, you know, I think the Obama, the change in government in, in the US there, you know, I think our recent government here has been pretty good. But, you know, Albanese, I wasn't a big fan, you know, things aren't easy with Albanese. But the first couple of weeks, I'm quite impressed. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a hard, thankless job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I admire those sort of people. Um, and is there a course that you've completed um, recently? Well, actually, in uh, COVID, during the COVID lockdown, I did a sports nutrition uh, diploma. Um, or something I've always wanted to do. Um, got more into the physiology of the human body and what food makes you uh, do certain things. And, and uh, yeah, I'm always concerned about the obesity crisis that we're going through and things like that. So to understand more about the relationship of diet and uh, human behavior was, uh, was quite, quite informative. And, um, you know, hopefully it'll be helpful also, you know, in my ongoing career. Mm, definitely. Um, very interesting. Um, do you want to head off into the uh, main interview questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be great. yeah. Um, so we'll start off with um, why do you think home management is, is important? Well, we spend so much time at home and there's so many things that can go wrong. So, you know, having a good, safe environment that's uh, secure gives you peace of mind as well. So, you know, being, you know having a good management system in your house and look, there's a, there was a great um, show many years ago um, on television and it was uh, comparing two people, one who was sort of um, like the odd couple, one who was a bit of a slob and the other guy who was a bit fanatical about cleanliness and tidiness and organisation. And the two coexisted in the same, you know, the same house. And it, it always amused me when I was a kid, but as an adult with children and things like that, you, know, you have a house with, you know, I'm not saying I've, I've got those sort of people, but of different dynamics and being able to manage all that and keep, keep everything cohesive and working and, and everyone happy, it's, uh, it's quite complex. Would you, do you think you need everyone in the house to um, be participating in this or do you think it's maybe down to one person to set the rules? Well, no, because everyone has to participate. Look, someone could set the main rules, and it all depends. If you were five uni students living together, there might be different dynamics than if it was a mother and father and children, or even if you had grandparents, par you know, grandparents, their children and their grandchildren, which is quite common these days. So there's three generations in one house, and each generation has a different uh, philosophy, um, different wants and needs. So... Everyone has to contribute, but also everyone has to accept the, the contribution. If you want contribution, you have to be able to accept the contribution, mm. which I think is important. Yes. Um, and what about some misconceptions um, about household management? Well, I don't know about misconceptions. It's all, it's all about humanity and relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hiding things from each other is... is probably not a good way. Being too honest sometimes is probably not a good thing. But, um, you know, if everyone has their sort of jurisdiction and jobs or chores or whatever you want to call it, and everyone, you know, does those things, even if it's to the minimalist part, then, you know, there's no criticisms. And um, I think that's probably the most important. Mm. Um, so... We'll get on to food safety. You did touch on this a little bit before about why food safety is important, but do you want to um, explain a little bit more? Well, I guess th there's a couple of factors with food safety. 
And in the past generations, we probably ate most of our meals in the house. And, uh, you know, we would go shopping two or three times a week and we would store a lot of food in our house. And modern trend is that we eat out, you know, uh, far more than, than previous generations. And eating out of the home is, you know, could be 50% even more um, than actually eating in the house. And when I say eating in the house, I mean meals cooked by the household, not uh, delivery meals. And that's, that's probably a third component um, you know, the, the whole de 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 meal delivery um, trend that's going on now and it's only going to grow longer and stronger. You know, a few years ago, all we got delivered was pizza. Now we get delivered from every, um, every restaurant in our neighbourhood and plus we can get meals delivered that need to be cooked and assembled. So there's a, there's a, a second, secondary process in all that as well. So the complexity of food safety has... Um, out of that is not just buying food, raw food and cooking it yourself. You're buying processed food, you're storing that, you know, that has a long shelf life. Um, when it opens, the shelf life on the packet's different to the actual real shelf life of the product. Um, home delivery food, had it been cooked in the kitchen before and cooked chilled and then they reheated it and delivered it to your house and you think it's fresh and it's not. So there's a whole lot of different attributes that we now have to be aware of as far as managing our, um, our food safety in the house. I hadn't even thought about food delivery, but that's such a good point. Um, so if, if you order something, you know, that's 30 minutes away, so it's cooked, put into that little carrier and then driven to you, is it still safe to eat if it's like sort of warm and it's being kept in this box? Yeah, so what we call, in the, the main rules of food safety are if it's cold food, it should be kept cold. If it's hot food, it should be kept hot and eaten hot. Um, there is a process in manufacturing where we cook food and we rapidly chill it and then we reheat it. But at every point along the, the chain, there's, a, there's things called kill steps, so which where we're killing any potential bacteria in the food. And a kitchen will, will uh, cook a food to the kill step of that food and it's usually above 72 degrees, which is, the, sal which is the, the bacteria salmonella that we're trying to kill. And that's the most obvious um, bacteria that can really harm us quickly. And so if we cook it to 72 degrees, we then have four hours as it cools down before bacteria will actually start to multiply. If there, if there are any bacteria that get onto the food after it's gone through the kill step. So as it cools down, there's potential if it's left uncovered, that um, bacteria could land on the food that's in the air, somebody could brush by, touch it, could fall off somebody's clothing, or a hair could fall out of somebody's head, or anything like that, could then recontaminate the hot food as it's cooling down. And then once it gets below the 60s is, um, is where bacteria really starts to, to um, multiply very, very quickly. Um, and if you think of your core body temperature, you know, we talk about, you know, we're in a high 36s. Once we get above high 36s, the, the breakdown in our bodies is very, very, very quick. 37, we get sick. 38, we're, we're really, really sick. 39, 40, we're, we're almost dead. So it's only a few degrees. Mm. So if you think of all that the same in food safety, a few degrees is very, very critical for growing bacteria. But generally, the restaurant, you have to trust the restaurants, cook the food to the kill step of 72 degrees. And you've got four hours for the, as the temperature is dropping before the food is actually not, not in, in, a, in a good state. So then when you get it home, so let's say the guy's cooked it, it sat on the counter for 20 minutes, delivery guy's taken half an hour. So you've already gone through one hour you'll consume it quickly because you're sitting there waiting, I'm waiting, I'm hungry. So let's say within another 30 minutes you've eaten the food, that's an hour and a half. And then as leftovers, you might leave on the bench for half an hour, an hour. My advice would be to put it in the fridge as long as you can. Um, but then how long do I hold it for in the fridge? Do I, you know, it's Sunday night, do I then have it for lunch on a Wednesday? Is it still safe? And that's the part which is, the management of that's where the management of your uh, food safety plan should come in. Mm. 
So, yeah, how long should you keep your leftovers for? Well, the rule of thumb, if you're cooking it yourself and you've been in control, it's raw food. Let's say you've, you, let's say you've cooked something with raw chicken. So you've, you've, you've processed some chicken in some way, marinated, whatever, cooked it with some vegetables. You've got some leftovers. You've, you've uh, sealed it in a container. You've put it in the fridge. So that's day one. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you've, it should be consumed within five days including the first day, which is the day you produce the food. Mm-hmm. So even if you don't eat it, if you just produce it and put it in the fridge, that's day one. Yeah. So let's say that's Monday. So then by Friday, that's when um, it should be definitely con- consumed. Mm-hmm. If you're in control of it all and it's been refrigerated below four degrees for that whole five days. Mm-hmm. So that's the, that's the, the, um, the critical time and temperature. The warmer the the warmer the temperature is, the less time that you can hold it. But if you just use a rule of five, and I can be anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, my phone will ring. Dad, I've had a chicken parma in the fridge for three days. Is it okay to eat? And I say, yeah, it's okay to eat. So you've got five days. But there's also obvious things of spoilage, you know, and odor is one of the strongest things. Mm-hmm. So most things you can smell it and if it smells in any way shape or form wrong then doesn't matter how many days it's it's it, you know it's just it's just thrown away right so that's one the other thing some things you can't i mean you can't taste bacteria but rotten food you can smell i mean you can't smell um, bacteria but then it, as soon as you taste food if it tastes slightly not right again even if you've bought it in a restaurant or it's been delivered or you've cooked it yourself and you taste it and you say, it doesn't taste like it usually, just don't take the risk. So the other week, my partner and I bought some blue grenadier from the supermarket and we opened it up, it smelled really fishy. Mm. Um, and then we cooked it and I took a bite and I was like, nah, I'm not eating this. It tasted um, bitter and metallic. So we threw it out and it was very sad because it was like a $15 piece of fish. Mm. Um, so is, is that an example of... Exactly. Um, That's a great example. Yeah. However, things that are, especially from the supermarket, if it's in a, a packaging that extends its shelf life, so fish will give off gas as it's, as it's um, you know, it's obviously decomposing. Then when you release the, open the packet, you get a waft of a really bad odor and then just leave it for a couple of minutes even rinse it under a tap and if you're still getting that ammonia odor from fish is more of an ammonia odor then you sort of go oh this you know but if you taste it and it but what happens is your senses take over it's like have you ever done the cinnamon test have you um, ever tried to eat a spoon i, I guarantee it's it's great fun video it try to eat a teaspoon of cinnamon as soon as you put it in your mouth, the back of your throat closes and you can't swallow it because the powder is so fine, there's something in your sensory, in your mouth and your throat that detects the powder and and doesn't want you to swallow it because it, it detects it's poison or it, they don't, it's, it, it's unidentifiable. So your body shuts, it, your, body shuts your throat down and you, and you cough and all the cinnamon puffs out and it's quite funny. But... Smelling and tasting are the same sort of things. Your body, your brain and your throat and everything talks to each other and senses something's not quite right. So go with that. We call it the gut feeling, but it's actually your, your body telling you this is poison, don't eat it. And if you get that ever feeling, don't, take, don't risk it. It's only $15. You know, we'll go into food wastage a bit later, but, you know, getting food poisoning over a $15 or even a five dollar leftover or a two dollar leftover, it's not. It's just not worth it. Mm, yeah, um, I've had food poisoning so many times. It's not fun. I can tell everyone. Um, is it just important for food safety? Is is getting sick the only reason that you would want to implement food safety? Well, look, get, there's getting sick and there's dying. So there's if you're an immune compromised person, and we talk about young people. And we talk about elderly people, talk about people with a compromised immune system. I mean, if you look at the COVID impact, how it's um, 
how it's affected the aged care as opposed to, you know, 20 to 30-year-olds. Not many 20 to 30-year-olds die from COVID. It's the same with food poisoning. So if you're immune compromised and you get a, a really bad case of salmonella, it can kill you. And all of our food safety manufacturing in kitchens in Australia and, and most, of the, uh, most of the world is based on salmonella poisoning because that's what will kill you. Um, it can make you uh, feel very unwell for, for hours, days, weeks. So, you know, the impact on your life, if, you, you know, if you're a busy life, um, you're running a business and all of a sudden you just can't go anywhere because you can't go too far from a bathroom or from a, from a bucket, which is, you know, it's not, um, it's not very, very uh, nice. I mean, I was at a chef conference in Korea. This is a very true story. There was 3,000 chefs at a chef conference. At the opening ceremony, 1,500 out of those 3,000 people got food poisoning. 1,500 chefs at an international event. And there's not enough bathrooms in a conference or a hotel to manage that. So it becomes, a, you know, a really, really bad situation, it becomes a dilemma for everybody. Um, and it's the same thing in your house. If you've only got two bathrooms and five people get food poisoning, you know, and everyone has to go to the bathroom at the same time, which, which is the outcome. It's the, I mean, it's, it sounds horrible, but that's the reality of it. So um, it's the amusing part of it. We're all having a little laugh, but, you know, that's the, the severity of it. So um, you do want to avoid it. And the simple things you can do to avoid um, food poisoning, um, and you said you've had it a few times, and hopefully you'll get some tips out of this. But, you know, I can't remember, I think once in 20 years I've had food poisoning, and I still don't know how I got it, but it could have been water. I don't know. I would like to say on the record, uh, whenever I've gotten food poisoning, it was not me cooking. It's not my family cooking. It was usually at a restaurant. Yeah. Um, Look, there's, there's a few myths around it as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been, you know, in my business, I've been accused a few times of, of, uh, of food, food poisoning outbreaks. And I've, I could always prove that it wasn't the last meal that the person ate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being... Um, open-minded is very, very important when you're trying to find the cause of a food poisoning outbreak. But we always think it's the last thing I ate. Oh, yeah, it was the chicken sandwich. I didn't taste that good. But it could have been something you ate 12 or 16 hours ago. It could be um, touching the door handle. It could be touching a seat getting on, a, on public transport. You know, it doesn't always come directly from food. Contamination comes a lot from touching and from, from not washing hands properly. And the first rule of any domestic cooking or eating or deliveries or any food, wash your hands properly with hot water and some sort of soap with a bacteria, um, you know, a, a um, chlorine or a, a detergent that will kill bacteria in it and wash them thoroughly I don't know if you've ever seen the medical shows where they wash their hands and they really soap up. I mean, seriously, it takes a minute, a minute 30, wash, dry your hands with paper towel, throw it in a bin. Don't use, um, you know, towels that have been sitting there or tea towels hanging off the oven door or oven mitts or your, or your apron or whatever, but use a, use a disposable paper towel. So it's detergent, hot water, paper towel, get in the, get in the routine. If you're handling raw meat, fish, use gloves. If you, if you can afford to buy disposable gloves, use gloves, throw them away at the end. If, uh, if not, wash your hands in between each step. So again, it's all about touching. Okay, you can, and that while you're cooking, you can, you know, you can, you might brush your hair by, you know, rub your eyebrow. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, if you watch people, when they're working with food, how many things they actually touch. It's, um, you know, it is very, very critical for, for, the, for the washing of the hands. That's step number one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the next step? So step number two is then a clean work environment. I have uh, several chopping boards and I have one chopping board with which I only use for raw meat or raw, raw chicken or raw fish. I have one chopping board for that. And then I have other chopping boards for vegetables, 
and I have other chopping boards if I'm cutting cheese that I'm going to eat that's not going to be cooked. So remember I spoke before about the kill step. So if you're making a salad, there is no kill step. Mm. You wash, you must wash all the vegetables, uh, make sure, and it's and it's more for uh, pesticides and, and a lot of things are grown in dirt, like lettuces are grown in dirt, you know, things are grown below the ground. Um, and bacteria can come in in all, all shapes and forms and spores and things like that come in soils, fertilizers, you know, a lot of it's manure, E. coli comes in manure, so, you know, washing is important. But um, have a, have it, if you only have two boards, have one for raw, raw meat and one for your vegetables and your cheeses and, and other things like that. So when you're cooking food that's not going to be cooked, so there's no kill step, wash it. And handling then is very, very, very important. So, you know, in restaurants and, and things now, we have a, a rule, if it's not going to be cooked, wear gloves 100% of the time. Okay. If it's going to be cooked, it's not so important. Um, but still, for me, if I'm touching raw chicken, I'll now I always wear gloves because because they're available and they're cheap and uh, it keeps things safe. I can peel them off and throw them in. Mm. Because uh, chicken is probably the, the thing we get food poisoning from the most because we determine that all chicken has salmonella on it somewhere. So when you break... When you when you uh, kill a chicken and, and take out its its bowel and stomach, sometimes if the bowel breaks, salmonella could then get onto the chicken flesh. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a cow or a lamb, it's completely different. Uh, the way they process and the animals bigger and things like that, there is no contamination from the stomach or bowel in any um, in any uh, red meat um, abattoirs and things like that. But poultry is a bit different, so we assume that all poultry has salmonella. So that's the critical um, one where we don't want to be cross-contaminating the, the, the touching the chicken onto our knife and then onto using that knife then the hands contaminated onto something else and, and things like that. So you did mention um, if you're, you know, you have a separate meat, a separate board for meat and a separate board for vegetables, things that aren't going to be cooked. If you're making, say, a stew uh, or a um, stir fry where you have chicken and then you have vegetables, is it okay to cut the chicken and then cut the vegetables with the same utensils because you're going to cook them all together anyway? Uh, it, yes, it is and it isn't because if you then touch the utensil and then you touch the fridge door and then you touch the, the tea towel, so you, you're contaminating everything. Mm -hmm. So if you use, you can use the same utensil, but wash it in between. So what I would do if I'm doing my prep, I cut up the chicken, then I'd wash the knife in, in warm water, dry it, put the board, rinse the board off because there might be some protein on the board. And if you cook that in, if you put that in the dishwasher, it'll cook onto the board anyway. So rinse that under the tap, put that into the dishwasher. Or if you don't have a dishwasher, wash it. Um, you, look, if you only have one board, turn the board over, wash it, turn the board over. But uh, always sanitize the board. If you can have two boards, make sure they're different colors. It makes it easy. You have a white board and a green board, and then you're not going to mix it up. Cut up your chicken, tidy up all that. And what I would be doing if I was doing a stir fry, anyway, I'd be marinating the chicken, putting it in the fridge for half an hour. Then I do all my veg prep, and then I then I do the cooking. So I sort of just think it through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, I know what it's like. We're having a glass of wine. We're cutting up some chicken. I cut up an onion. I throw the onion in. I throw the chicken out. I cut up a capsicum. It will be okay, but again, it's it's the cross contamination from the chicken to the utensil to the other things that you're touching in the in the vicinity of in your kitchen. Okay, and would you would you say you always should just have one separate meat one, even if you sterilized it? If you can, yeah. I mean, chopping boards are cheap. You know, those plastic chopping boards are five to ten dollars. You know, if you can have two, have two. If you can't have two, well, wash it in between uses, but okay. really wash it and sanitize it. Okay. Um, because you could be cooking chicken, uh, cutting chicken, and then some vegetables for a stir fry, and then a salad or a baguette, you know, to serve some bread with it. Or, you know, you might slice an avocado to garnish it with, or chop some coriander to sprinkle on the top, which isn't going to be cooked. So there's always that risk. Mm. What are some other rules? Um, one that I've heard is you keep the raw meat on the bottom of the fridge and you keep other things on the top. 
Is uh, do, you, you, do you use that at your own home? Well, absolutely. And going back to uh, culinary school, that's probably the first thing in cross-contamination, the biggest thing is. And the, the number one reason is that raw meat and fish, as it, as it breaks down, it, it, um, it, it drips moisture. Moisture comes out of it. So, you know, in particular chicken and fish also, we put a lot of ice around fish so, that, so you're getting a lot of, uh, you know, melted ice and things like that drips down onto the tray that you're holding it in. And if that overflows and then drips down onto your lettuce or your apple underneath it. So you always put the meat at the bottom because if it spills, it's just going to spill into the bottom of the fridge and you and you can vis visibly see it anyway, you can mop it up. Um, so that's the main reason. It's to, to avoid any cross-contamination from the raw juices of the raw meat dripping onto your um, other other items within the fridge. So if you do just keep it in, in a box where it's not going to drip onto anything, it should be okay? Yeah, but potentially, if look, if you're leaving it there for three or four days, it potentially could, and it only needs one drip. Mm. You know, one drip to fall on your apple, you'll bite the apple without washing it, and, you know, there you go. Mm. Actually, that reminds me, something that I did want to ask. So you did mention washing your, you know, your lettuce and your fruits and everything before you eat them. What's the best way to wash a lettuce? Well, the best way is, there's, well, there's several ways and there's different kinds of lettuce. So you can tear the lettuce apart, rinse it, rinse it in running water in a, um, in a colander mm -hmm. or filling a, a sink up with, um, with water. And, and if you do that, you'll actually see in the bottom of the sink the silt that comes out of your of washing, but if you agitate the water at all, then the silt comes back up through the um, through the uh, vegetable that you're washing. So, running water through a colander is probably the best way. And then, then if you if you can put it in a salad spinner to get rid of the water mm. off it. So I wasn't sure if you putting into a colander and rinsing it was the best way because. It just seems like there's one stream of water. Does it hit every single piece of... Well, you're, you're moving it around. Moving it around. Hands. And look, the lettuce, most of the of the, um, most of the contaminations on the outer, outer leaves, so you're tearing those off. But if you get a leak, for example, and you split a leak down the middle, there's actually dirt in between the layers of leak. So you've got to actually... You know, leak, I would, put, I would soak in some water and then I would rinse it in a colander. Okay, so a two-step process. Two-step process. Mm -hmm. You know, carrots, I peel them first and then and then wash them. You know, potatoes, obviously, you, you know, you're washing them in water, peeling them, cutting the eyes out, things like that. Should you always peel your vegetables? No, no. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, th potatoes and things that have shoots on, and, and the thing with potatoes, now you can buy washed potatoes, which are very, very clean. I mean... The evolution of potatoes. I mean, they've genetically modified potatoes to, they are a white, medium size, can be used in every cooking thing. The potato industry has developed the perfect potato. Right? So yeah, you don't have to. And a lot of the nutrients, if we talk about the health benefits of eating, a lot of the nutrients are in the skin. Um, carrots we buy these days are smaller. They're not the great big, what we used to call horse carrots, where the skin is very coarse and chewy. Um, and has growths on it. You know, you get little buds coming out of potatoes and things like that. You want to cut those off because they're they're not very pleasant to eat. Um, and sometimes you might have little indentations in that the pocket dirt and things like that. Where you you know you want to you know in, in asparagus in particular the, the, the big thick asparagus you have the little fronds on the side, mm -hmm. and if you peel those back, you get little tiny specks of dirt in there that you wouldn't normally. Um, um, remove just by washing so those sort of things but you know if the carrots are smaller yeah just even just give them a little scrub with a scourer but the peel is is very very nutritious you know apples do you need you don't peel apples you know if you're making an apple crumble you might peel the apple mm. but if you're just eating an apple you wouldn't you know if you're eating a pear and it's the same sort of thing if the peel is edible and not not adding any sort of bitterness to the to the uh to the food, by all means. I did wonder that because I don't peel any of my vegetables. 
Um, I do wash them before. Saves a lot of time as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> oh, and just like, you know, having to take the compost bowl up, down um, and do that, it's just, that's just annoying. <laughs> Any other rules um, that we should be following? Well, storage. Storage is very, very important. And look, we talked a bit about, um, you know, there's a difference between cooking food yourself, buying food delivered, or buying processed food in a supermarket. And let's talk about a lasagna. So I buy a cooked lasagna in a supermarket, and it's in a vacuum sealed packet. I don't know if it's been frozen or not frozen. I don't know how long the manufacturer... Um, I'm assuming the manufacturer you followed all the all the manufacturing guidelines, and I've got a you know, I mean our our main supermarket chains have very very strict rules and regulations and do inspections and all sorts of things. So I trust that that's a safe product, but it will say on the lasagna used by let's say 15 days, I've got 15 days, mm -hmm. because it's been cooked under a vacuum, and and we call it a retort process. So it extends the shelf life of a product. So it, it's been cooked in the sealed environment where it's killed the bacteria. It's been cooled down in the same sealed environment. So no bacteria can get in, which has extended the shelf life. The only thing that will deteriorate is the quality of the product, but there'll be no, it'll be safe to eat. So it's fair to say I'm going to give you 15 days. Now on the, on the packet, we'll have the use-by date. That comes to your house and you go, I only want to eat half of it, mm. okay? So the dilemma now is, was it already frozen, then it was thawed, and then I cooked it, can I freeze it again? Or I can just seal it in the fridge because I've still got 14 days left of the shelf life. But once you open that packet, that shelf life becomes void. And you have the five days, as we spoke about earlier, the five days, the first day is the day you open it, and you have four more days after that to consume it. But just because it says it. So therefore, it's important to either make a mental note, but then someone else in your family, you might go on holidays and leave it in the fridge, comes in and go, oh, there's still 12 days on that. Oh, there's still eight days, and there's still six days on that. There's still four days on that. And then they eat this soggy, horrible lasagna and get sick from it. So, you know, it's important. You know, we all we all uh, go to Officeworks, get a Sharpie, and just, just write the the new use by date on it, just write it on the packet or put it in a Ziploc bag, a big Ziploc bag and just write the date on it with a, with a Sharpie, you know, and that goes with storage of anything that's been decanted out of a packet is if it's going in the freezer, the freezer I call is the black hole. You put stuff in that freezer and then it freezes. Three weeks later, you, you go, what, what, what was, what was I thinking? Why did I save half a, you know, half a bowl of tomato soup? What is that? Is it tomato soup? It's all crystallized and it's all... And our domestic freezers aren't good at freezing things from 4 degrees to minus 15 or minus 18. Whereas when you buy frozen food, it's been through a rapid chilling process. It stays frozen. The freezer isn't actually freezing. It's keeping it frozen. So if you're putting something in the freezer... Put the date that you put it in the freezer and what it actually is. You know, it's cooked chicken. It doesn't have to be anything descriptive, but so that when you go back there and you'll find you'll actually use a lot more things in your freezer if you get, oh, that's what that is. Oh, it's, no, it's been in there for six months. I'm not eating that. You know, because we always go, oh, how long was that in there for? Oh, what's the use by that on it if it's a processed food? Oh, it was used by two years ago. Oh, man, it's been in there for over two years. Like, And that's what happens. It becomes the black hole. The freezer is not um, not a good place to store stuff. Um, so, yeah, labeling, packaging, um, there's so many things you can buy. Cheap, sealable containers. I prefer glass uh, with the sealable lids that you can also microwave in um, because they can be washed. You know, I'm, I'm a... You know, reuser of things, not a throwaway of things. You know, if something comes in a takeaway container from the from Uber Eats, you know, I'll wash that container and then I'll use it again and again and again, which until it starts to crack, which sometimes is not a good thing. But yeah, buy glass um, because glass doesn't give off any toxins. Plastic gives off toxins when you, especially if you're microwaving. 
Um, you know, you're going from hot dishwasher, breaks down the uh, structure of the plastic, storing to microwaving it can be, you know, it's not a good thing. So glass, and plus you can see what's in it in the fridge. Don't buy red containers and you can't see what's in it. Mm. If things are glass and you open the fridge door and you're hungry, you go, oh, yeah, I'll... If things are red in the fridge, you go, oh, what's that? I can't be bothered looking. You know, I'll, I'll just go for something processed out of the biscuit cupboard. So it encourages you to eat more of the leftovers as well. Um, so you mentioned before about um, the freezer. How long should you keep things in the freezer? Very, very good question. Not too long. Six months is probably the longest. Um, if you know the origin of the product, and you've cooked it yourself. You know, if a if a person delivers you a um, a casserole, your neighbour or something or a friend, you know, I probably wouldn't freeze it at all. I'd probably eat it for dinner and take it for my lunch the next day. You know, not that I don't trust my neighbour or my friend, but you know, it's been in their car. It's you don't know what their what what their situation is, how good their kitchen and hygiene and stuff is. So, if you have been in control of it up to six months, you know, cakes and things like that. The, you know scones you know like you're talking a dollar's worth of product you're freezing something you're keeping it frozen for six months you, you know are things really that bad consume it take it to work and put it on the at, at the coffee station you know share if you've got leftovers share it. eat it for lunch the next day try not to freeze you know, but if you're buying frozen things and sometimes you're like you, you go to uh, places like costco you, know, you buy things in huge packaging to save money. You you need to, you know, like frozen berries and frozen vegetables, frozen potato items. You know, there's a lot of stuff at the moment like um, cauliflower rice, you know, all the things that are low carb, vegan, plant based. You know, a lot of that stuff's frozen. So keep your freezer for more value add. You know, eat your leftovers. Yep. Yeah, it's safer. What happens if you keep your leftovers in the freezer for more than six months? Well, there's there's very low chance of bacteria actually getting in. But what happens is the structure of the food starts to deteriorate. The, the food becomes gets frostbite, and, you, and you'll see in your freezer that it crystallizes. So every time you open that small freezer drawer or the door, you're letting the cold air out and warm air in. Mm -hmm. And that, that warm air's got moisture in it, and as it chills down, it creates crystals, and then you get ice build up and anything that's not wrapped or covered or but even the plastics that we're wrapping things in the glad wrap the, the the cling film whatever you call it yeah that deteriorates as well so then you get the frostbite you get deterioration of the quality of the product which is ruining in nutritional value so you know it's a, but it's very unlikely that you will you'll get sick from it mm. yeah. and what's the way, best way to defrost like um, your leftover um, lasagna in the uh, defrost cycle in the microwave. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you have to do it overnight, uh, in the morning take it out, put it in the fridge on the on the uh, on the lower shelf with a drip tray under it, and uh, defrost it overnight in the fridge is probably the easiest way to do it. If you need to use it straight away, defrost cycle in the microwave. If it's a frozen vegetable and you're and you're making a stir fry, you can always just run hot water over it in a, un, under a colander, and then it's just throw it into your stir fry. Can you put frozen vegetables like straight in the pan? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All frozen vegetables have been uh, are cooked to a certain degree, and uh, and they've been snap frozen, in, you know, like very very quickly frozen, which which uh, also saves the nutrient value of the vegetable. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can you can eat raw vegetables, uh, frozen vegetables like ice creams if you want on a hot day. Yeah, no problem. This is a a personal one. Um, my partner bought some blueberries and forgot to put a frozen blueberries. He left them out on the counter overnight um, and they defrosted completely. Could you put them back in the freezer or just throw them away? You can put them back in the freezer. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned before, your, your freezer isn't really designed for freezing big bags I would bro probably break them down into smaller bags mm -hmm. to freeze them quicker. Um, if the bag's been sealed, there's very low risk of getting any bacteria in the bag. If it was chicken, throw it straight away. Mm -hmm. If it's been out for 12 or 14 hours, there's no way I would I would say even I wouldn't even cook it and eat it. 
But we talked before about there's a four hour window mm -hmm. um, where you can, you know, we talk about dropping things on the floor as a five second rule, which mm -hmm. doesn't exist, by the way. There's a four hour rule. So if it's after four hours, um, I would be conscious of it. The chances are you're not going to cook those blueberries. Mm. Uh, you're going to be probably putting them into smoothies and, and desserts and things like that. So, you know, you are adding a risk value. But as long as you, you, you know yourself, you're, you're in charge of it. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry too much about blueberries. Okay. If the packet was open, yes, that's a different story. Okay. I would put them in the fridge and consume them. Okay. Yeah. Um. So we did talk about how long to keep um, frozen food, and we've talked about um, leftovers. Um, what about things like spices, um, dry foods, um, flour? How long should you keep those? Well. We talked. We talk about use by dates, and there's best before dates. Mm -hmm. So, so we put best before dates. We describe those as things that um, inherently aren't going to make you sick if you keep them longer and longer and longer. And if you go through your spice cupboard, and I have, you know, I probably guilty, you know, guilty. I probably have fifty or sixty canisters of things in my spice cupboard because I cook a lot and I'm a chef, and you know, you're adding lots of flavors and things like that. So. A spice will deteriorate in quality and spiciness, let's say, let's call it spiciness, aroma, flavor, um, its color might, might, de, um, might delaminate its color. So storing in a, storage in a, a darker place, in containers that don't, don't emit light into them. And you know, some great, the, my favorite, dried spices are from um, from IGA. I don't know, I'm not branding anything, but they're called G Fresh and they come in a, uh, a decent sized container. They're cheap and they are a clear bottle so you can actually see what's in it in your cupboard because you're hunting through to find that, you know, the cumin or the coriander or whatever. But um, but they've also got a big label around which so you're not getting too much light. Um, but look, they're a, they're a cheap commodity as well. We, they they come in small containers, yeah. You know, use them, use them. I I would, you know, um, use them, add them to your dishes, experiment with them. But yeah, you won't get sick from them. Just that the, you're just using stuff that has low low impact in cooking, so you need to use more. Um, flour and things like that, because some products actually uh, has has gets grubs in them, weevils. Uh, larvae, parasites in the big factories where they're processed, they, they're just inherent with, with that, um, that problem. So the only thing is you might get um, larvae hatching. So if flour was old, I would, I would be putting it through a fine sieve just to see if there's anything wiggling in it. And, and they're white little, and they're not going to hurt you. It's a, it's a larva, it's a, it's a weevil, it's not going to hurt you. But it's 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 unpleasant to think I'm, I'm it's unpleasant to think I'm feeding my family, you know, little grubs without them knowing, uh, and that's something that's not your fault. It comes in the product. I mean, I've had pistachio nuts, um, in a jar, and I've gone to get the jar, and the jar's moving because mm. the pistachio nuts again they have a, you know, nuts, and you can you read it on the packet. When you open nuts, you should actually keep them in the fridge. Uh, uh -huh. Dried fruits, dried apricots, all those sort of um, things have the potential to have uh, uh, little larvae eggs in them, which then warm air gives it the, you know, while it's cold, they will never hatch. And if you eat them, you will never know you've eaten them. They won't hurt, harm you in any way. But if you see things crawling on your food and they turn into little, uh, little moths, so the little moth grubs and things like that. So, uh, you know. If it's open, nuts and, and dried fruits and stuff, you should keep it in the fridge. Okay. And there's also a myth about eggs. Mm -hmm. you know, do I need to put eggs in the fridge? Um, if you want to, if if you want to keep eggs for a period of time, keep them in the fridge. You buy them in the supermarket in the fridge, with the shelf life, which is a, a chilled shelf life. If you take them out of that environment, the shelf life drops. So if you want fresher eggs, keep them in the fridge. Okay. If you don't, but it's fine not to keep them in the fridge. But not for a long period of time. How long? So I would keep them for up to a week in, out of the fridge. Okay. Yeah. And the shelf life in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Whatever's on the, on the, um, yeah. 
on the uh, on the use by date. Okay, I always looked at the use by date and use that for the. Um... But does it look? There's a rule of thumb as well. We call it the rule of thumb. How it depends how confident you are, um, and I'm not suggesting that you do anything to um, risk to, to add any risk factors to what you're doing. But I recently went to a World Chefs conference, hundreds and hundreds of chefs. The, one of the biggest, the, the two biggest topics were wasting food and the environment, the impact on the environment of food. And, you know, considering that we should all eat more plant-based foods because it's beneficial for our environment. And we all know we have environmental problems. We can't hide from it anymore. But they, the statistic... The global statistic is one third of all food that is grown on this planet, one third, 33% is wasted. That's a massive amount. And if you consider how much food comes through a supermarket, how much of that food is, is determined by its use by date, the sellability of that food is determined by its use by date. How much do you look at a use by date when you buy food and you say, oh, it's only got two days and I'm not buying it? I will buy the newest milk in the, in the supermarket. We're programmed to do that. That's how our brain works. And, and how does milk, when we were kids, how does milk go from a seven-day shelf life to a 29-day shelf life? Uh, Does pasteurization? That, well, it's, to me, that's very, very, very scary. But you're right. You would always go for the newest milk. Mm -hmm. You would always go for the, the longer shelf life on anything. So therefore, you're actually pushing the, the lower use by dates closer and closer and closer to the bin. And once it gets to one day, the supermarket then sends it away to uh, food banks and, and landfill and, and all sorts of places, which, you know, and they're huge, huge consumers of food food waste. That's only one part of the chain. So use common sense with use by dates. Like cheese, like an aged cheddar is three years old. Some of that cheddar has been in a cave in New, Ze in New Zealand or uh, in Tasmania. Pangana cheddar lives in a cave off the, off, just off the sea for three years. And now you're telling me it has a use by date? The only thing that's going to happen to that cheese is going to get drier and older and tastier. So, but processed food, once you start grating cheese, you're adding air, airborne spores, human interaction, intervention, packaging, all that sort of stuff. Then you have to be a little bit more, um, but like cheese has a live bacteria in it, which improves the flavor and the, and the, the eatability of it the older it gets. Yogurt has a bacteria in it, which actually improves the biome of your stomach but there's a use by date on yogurt now yogurt can turn into cheese so it's sort of you know you, you've and butter you know butter discolors on the outside just scrape that millimeter off the outside and it's pure yellow butter on the inside you know, if it doesn't smell rancid it's not rancid mm. it's very very hard to make butter go rancid so you know oils things like that um you know we talked about flour you, know, you can sieve the, the any potential um, bugs out of it, but you know don't just throw it in the bin because it, the use by date states. If it's raw chicken, it, it there's no there's no rules around that. Raw chicken's raw chicken. Don't don't risk it. A steak, you know, in in uh, you know, not that long ago we would hang steaks and let them go blue, let them start rotting, and then just scrape the outside off because it in enhanced the flavor of the meat mm -hmm. you know we have uh, jugged hair off old old english re recipes going back to the 17th 18th century they used to ha hang the hairs in the shed until they went rotten scrape the maggots off them and then roast them and, and the flavor from that um you know decomposition actually enhanced and tenderized and yeah you know, so there's there's processes which we've followed since before electricity that we've eaten rotten food for you know for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you go back to before money, do you think people would have thrown any food in the rubbish bin? They would have made something out of everything. 
There was no food wastage in the 14th century, 15th century, I can guarantee you. But now we waste one third. A lot of it's to do with use-by dates mm. and that misconception of we're educated in a certain way. Um, and then that, look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I wouldn't eat things outside my use-by date either. But I would, you know, a, a piece of steak that's vacuum-packed from the supermarket, you open up, has an odour on it because it's been vacuum-packed in its own blood. Rinse it, let it sit on a plate for 20 minutes and then have a little smell and go, oh, that's, that's fine. And then you can eat it. Um, but most things can go past the juice by date. Anything processed like a biscuit, a Tim Tam, you know, a wagon wheel, a packet of potato chips, you know, all, all that sort of stuff, cornflakes, wheat bix, there's nothing in that that's going to make you, um, you know, it just might be a bit stale, that's all. Mm. Mm. So um, you did mention earlier, um, if you open something, you have to use it within five days. If I opened a packet of chips, would I have to eat? Well, I mean, it's not that hard to eat a packet of chips in five days, but um, if you didn't, other than affecting, you know, the flavour, it, it, it's not inherently... Well, um, it, it all depends what you did with the packet of chips. If you mm -hmm. put your hand in and grab the packet, Mm -hmm. then you're contaminating the whole packet. You can okay. tip it into a bowl, reseal it, put a peg on it, put it back in the cupboard, then that's fine. But the chips will go stale very, very quickly as soon as the air gets into them. I mean, they're in a, you know, in a, in a bag with some air and some, well, some nitrogen in there to take the air out because the air makes it stale. So, um, you know, five days. Just stick with the five days. Keep one rule for everything. Okay. It makes it simple. It's easy. We've, we've answered most of my questions. I think the last one is, do you have any tips in regard to food rotation um, in the fridge or in the cupboard? Well, the most the, the easiest one to remember, FIFO, first in, first out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we often go and buy far too much food and store it. So, you know, put the, put the old stuff at the front and the new stuff at the back. I know we're tempted to eat the fresh first. Um, we have a thing... At the at Olympic Games, for example, and I mentioned we have 16,000 athletes. So we will consume on a day approximately 100 to 120,000 pieces of bread. And I, and I include in that rolls, wraps, sliced bread, baguette, um, Turkish bread, all the different pita breads, um, flat breads. So 100, 100 to 120,000. So do I buy 100,000? Do I buy 120,000? If I buy 120,000 and I only consume 100,000, I've got 20,000 pieces left. And then tomorrow I've got 120,000 pieces coming and I've got another 20,000. So in two days I've got 40,000 pieces of bread, which is a huge corridor of bread crates full of bread. So what do I do? Do I keep on serving the old bread first? So then I, after three days I'm probably serving stale bread before I'm serving fresh bread. And so for the rest of the Olympics, everyone's eating stale bread while I catch up and, and restructure my ordering and stuff like that. Or do I bite the bullet and send that two, three day old bread to the food bank or go and feed the pigeons outside or do something else with it or tell the chefs to make bread and butter puddings or, you know, make breadcrumbs out of it or, or do something and just start serving the fresh bread again. So, you know, there's some products which are very low value products, which you tend to put in your freezer, loaves of bread in the freezer, like my goodness, so much space for so little value. Um, you know, sometimes you've just got to bite the bullet and use the fresh stuff first. But generally speaking, if you're buying tins of tuna, you know, put the old tins to the front and the new tins to the back. You know, those, those sort of things. If you're buying nuts or chocolate bars or packets of chips, it's first in, first out. So the oldest food it gets consumed first, the newest food goes to the back. And that's probably, you know, if we think of the three things, wash your hands, beware of cross-contamination with raw foods, storing of food, right labels, dates on things. You know, three, three easy steps. Cook hot food to 72 degrees um, and rotate your food first in, first out you've pretty much got your own food safety plan in your house in four steps. The other one, I mean, I have a thermometer which I connect to my fridge, um, which is displayed on the outside because I just, just 
when we go around our kitchens, we're always checking the, the fridge temperatures. We check them six times a day, every four hours. Someone checks it and writes it down. So it's just a visual thing. I, you know, sometimes I open the fridge and I take something and go, it doesn't feel very cold. And then I start to get a little bit panicky because I know the consequences of storing food that's not cold. Um, so I have a thermometer on the outside of my my uh, food. I made chicken parmas last night and I checked the core temperature of the chicken before I actually served it. You know, I've been a chef for over 30 years and uh, one of my kids said to me, oh, you, you, know, you have to still check the temperature. I said, listen, I just don't want to risk, you know, uh, serving you undercooked chicken, you know, and, I, and it was. It was 80 degrees, so it was fine. But... Um, it was just it was just not that I didn't trust myself, but it was just a, a habit I've got into now. Anytime I cook chicken, I just put one of those probe thermometers in. So you know you can you, your food safety plan can develop as much as you want it to, but you know five simple steps. You know then you go and I get a thermometer, I get a probe. You know they're, all, they're just cheap little things that you can um, keep your family safe. Mm. We got a meat thermometer just to make sure we're cooking all our meat correctly. Yeah. Mm. But also it helps on quality. You're not overcooking. That's true. I yeah. hate overcooked chicken. Because one, one of my favorite tips for, for meat cooking, if you get a roast leg of lamb and cook it at 120 degrees for four hours and then cook it at 180 degrees for half an hour to crisp it up, you will have a bigger leg of lamb than if you cook it at 180 degrees the whole time for, for an hour and a half. Because it's time and temperature. The lower temperature, the longer you cook it for, it still cooks the same, but it doesn't denature the protein, so it doesn't shrink. Oh. So you get a you actually get a better, more a better, more moist, more moist, a, a product with more moisture, uh, a larger piece than you would if you cook it at, at a hotter temperature. Ah, oh, so I didn't know that. Cook your roast longer at a lower temperature. That's a great tip. Thank you. Um, anything else you'd like to say um, about food safety? No, I think, look, I think try, you know, don't try to overcomplicate it because then you just start, um, when in doubt, throw it out. You know, that's just something we say in the kitchen, when in doubt, throw it out. First in, first out. You know, they're just simple things. Clean as you go. You know, hot soapy water, wash your hands a lot, you know, more than normal when you're cooking. Um, and, 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 if you, and if you're cooking, wear an apron. I mean, you know, it's don't cook in the clothes you were working in and then go and sit on the couch with the, some of the food residue on your clothes. And, you know, you're just contaminating your whole house. Um, put an apron on and keep the apron clean, you know. Also, it's pretty cool. You can buy cool aprons. You look a little bit cheffy, you know. Impress your friends and, and family. I have so many aprons and I never use any of them. Exactly. So, we all do. Yeah. But why do chefs wear aprons? Uh, Keeps you clean, you know. Stops true. the cross-contamination. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, practice or the habit um, section. Um, so what's something you do at home um, to practice food safety? I mean, you've already spoken a lot about it. Well, the first thing is washing hands. Like if I've been out, the first thing I do when I go home is um, is wash my hands, mm -hmm. especially with with, with um, the recent pandemic we've had. You know, our whole sort of life's been turned upside down. We're a lot more um, cautious now, and and you know where we've been, what we've touched. So, washing the hands is probably the the, the number one thing. Um, getting to have that, getting into the habit of planning one meal a week, then two meals a week, then three meals a week, and then and then get your repertoire uh, up. There's some great, there's some great, great websites now for recipes. Uh, Recipe Tin Can is one of one of my favorites. And the detail in the methodology for um, amateur cooks is incredible. Like they're all tested, probably one of my go-tos. Taste is another great one, but there's there's hundreds. Find one that suits you, um, but get into the habit of cooking for yourself. Teach yourself how to cook. Cooking is one of the easiest things on the in the world, as long as you've got the ingredients. If you're missing an ingredient, it gets frustrating. But you know what? As long as it's not weighed and measured like in a cake or a scone or a biscuit, 
if you're freelancing a casserole or a pie or a chili con carne or a bolognese or a you know add your own twist to it if you don't have this add that just experiment you've got to just open the cupboard and go i'm going to try that ingredient you experiment learn like you'd be surprised how simple it is and how much enjoyment you will get out of cooking for yourself so wash your hands is an easy one cooking for yourself is a bit harder but you know post post the things that you cook to your friends on on instagram or or, uh, or facebook and and brag about it encourage your friends and family to participate in um you know because it, it, it's a community thing cooking is a community thing feeding people is a community thing it's not just something i do to enjoy myself it's actually something i do to stay alive and it's important to to be healthy so cooking for yourself removes processed food out of your diet brings uh, fresh ingredients into your diet and is a bit of fun as well. So I would get into that habit. What is one recipe that you recommend? Um, maybe um, you're saying make it a habit. What's something that you would recommend people try if they're not very good? Um, well, I would say, I would say um, think of an ingredient mm -hmm. because it's all around budget. Mm -hmm. Now you could be able to afford $50 a kilo fillet steak and then you know it would be a completely different conversation. But let's go with a um, but let's go with a plant-based meal because we're all talking about you know the environment and plant-based. So you know a red capsicum. What can I make out of a red capsicum? Now I'm going to need some protein, so I'm going to need some chickpeas. Let's say some chickpeas or some other legumes. But let's say it's chickpeas. So now I've got a red capsicum and chickpea and a tin of crushed tomatoes and some basil and some garlic and an onion. There you go, I've got a meal and I'm going to throw all that together and I'm going to slow cook it all to get that nice umami from the slow roasted tomatoes and the capsicum and I'm going to throw the chickpeas in and then I've got a little rice cooker, I'm going to make some rice. So I've just made a beautiful, nutritious, high fiber, high protein, low carb meal in 45 minutes and I've, and I've the cooking time's 35, so my prep time's 10 and it's cost me you know, I don't know, $10, $12, depending on the quality and if I've used organic in vegetables or not. So think of an ingredient and then build around it. If I was thinking of a meat ingredient, cheap one would be mince. So out of that, I could make a bolognese sauce. Again, some tomato, some basil, an onion, some garlic, and just let it cook for as long as you've got time. You can do it in 30 minutes, you can do it in three hours. The longer you cook it, the nicer it's going to be. The flavor is going to be nicer. Skim the oil off the top. Again, with that minced meat, I could make, make meatballs. I could make uh, a chili con carne. I could make a meatloaf. I could make a lasagna. You know, I could make a hamburger. You know, there's, there's many, many things. So don't try to think of a, of a recipe. Think of an ingredient. And then I can afford that ingredient. And I'm going to try four or five different things with it. This week I'm going to make a bolognese. Next week I'm going to make. And also the principles of cookery. There's only 14 principles of cookery. So braising, stewing, roasting, poaching, deep frying. You know, they're all the principles. So, okay, I've tried. I've, I've, I've made a, um, a bolognese soup. I've made a, it's like a braise or a stew. Now I'm going to try uh, a meat braise in the oven. And again, I just throw everything in a pot and put it in the oven for two hours. It's not complicated it's just organizing the time to prep it marinate the meat properly and all those sorts of things mm. and then also if you like measuring you know we talk about the um the odd couple you know my wife and i'm my wife's a beautiful cook but she loves baking and makes beautiful pastries and cakes and biscuits and and it, and uh, all that sort of stuff and for the rest of us that are all trying to cut our calories <laughs> but we still love it where I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a freehand cook. I throw things in a pot, taste it, and add more things and stuff like that. So, if you want to weigh and measure everything and and practice on the Victoria sponge, and uh, you can really start to show off to your friends and family as well. Um, I'm a bit the same. I um, tend to, you know, oh, it's it says half a tin of tomato. Well, what am I going to do with the other half? I'm going to chuck all of it in. Um, don't think it'll make a difference. But look, that's a very good point. And if it's a cooked leftover, 
you, you're more likely to take it to work the next day for your lunch or have it for breakfast or a snack when you come home from work. Where if it's half a tin of tomatoes, it sits in the fridge and then it gets a little black ring around the tin and you go, I'm not eating that and I'll throw it in the rubbish. So, you know, it's all about, you know, utilising your ingredients as best you can mm. with your own skills. But push yourself. It's not that hard. Yep. <laughs> yeah, anything, um, anything else that you do at home? Well, I would say essential tools in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. we, we mentioned the chopping boards, sharp knives, mm -hmm. and you don't have to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on knives. Actually, some of the cheaper brands are actually easier to sharpen because the steel's not so hard. Sharp knives are important and make the whole job much, much easier, quicker, and therefore you, you actually have a bit more fun. So sharp knife, Two, two chopping boards, a couple of mixing bowls, a good oven with a good seal in it so you can you can trust the temperature you're cooking in. I prefer to cook on gas, but I have been uh, tampering with um, induction cooking. So, you know, whatever whatever floats your boat there. But for me, I have a I have two Webers, a, a Weber Q and a smaller Weber Q. Um, they're a, sort of a bowl barbecue with the lid down, they really, really get some good um, convection heat in there. Um, probably the best barbecues and reasonably priced. But I have one which I only use for vegetables because um, I have members of the family that are pescatarian, and um, you know you don't want to cook the steak and then grill the grill the zucchini on the with a beautiful mullard flavour of the barbecue. So uh, you know I have one just for cooking vegetables on, which is a smaller one. A little bit extravagant, sure. And I have a herb garden. Now it doesn't matter how big your garden is. And your herb garden could be on the on the um, windowsill of the kitchen, could be on a kitchen bench. But adding fresh herbs to food makes food taste better. And some herbs, which hard herbs like thyme and rosemary and things like that, you throw in at the start of the cooking process. If you're doing a braise in the oven, for example, and some soft herbs like basil and coriander and parsley and chives, um, mint, you know, mint in a salad's beautiful, lemon verbena, you throw all that sort of stuff towards the end, mix it into a salad, chop a half a cup of all different herbs and throw it into a salad. Uh, again, healthy eating and you know, just spikes the flavors and the, the aromas and, and all that goodness you get at the end of a cooking or, or of a fresh vegetables or a salad or things like that. So yeah, you, you, they're the sort of essential tools. A little herb garden doesn't cost much and uh, it really, really adds some vibrant uh, flavors to your food. I did try growing basil once on my windowsill. Uh, I didn't grow it right and it just went really, really tall and didn't have any leaves. Yeah, too much light probably. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna try again in Bring. Well, basil such a like basil is is if you had one, would be basil, mm -hmm. because it has that beautiful sort of anesthetic flavour. You can cook with it, and uh, you can just eat it raw. It's it just you know you just eat the leaves. Mm. You rub them on your fingers and smell your fingers. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I do love basil. That's why I grow it. Yeah, very good. Mm. Um, so we'll go on to the open mic. Um, this is where you can talk about anything that you're interested in. Well, besides um, just living my life and, and trying to stay as healthy as possible, and it's interesting, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm in my 50s now and I've never worked harder on um, trying to stay strong, trying not to get fat um, in my life. You know, I'm tall and skinny. I've never worried about weight. I've never worried about exercise. I've always been active, you know, working in kitchens and, and things like that. Um, but I, I just, my, my number two, well, the two things that I'm very passionate about at the moment is healthy eating and how easy it is and how lazy we all are and, and uh, food wastage, the amount of food that we waste for, you know, silly, or not silly, but for reasons that are just, we're, we're just not educated enough or we're just, you know, we've just got too much money. I'm not. I'm not too sure exactly why we waste the amount of food that we do. Uh, a lot of it's down to regulation, and maybe we need to change some of the regulations around use-by dates and things, 
and where we can um, you know, second bite the food to, where we can send it to. Because I know in a kitchen, um, I can't send leftovers to, uh, to a food bank or things like that. I can send ingredients and I can send things that haven't been, you know, um, like a, I can't send a half lasagna, I can send a full lasagna. So it's sort of like, and I know there's a lot of people that, that could do with, with some of that stuff, but, but why do we get to that wasted food in the first place? But let's start with healthy eating. Now, I've spent the last 20 years, 22 years, feeding elite athletes around the world. I've studied sports nutrition. I've helped bodybuilders one-on-one um, get to perform to, their, to, to their, um, their peak. I've had boxers need to lose three kilos in three days uh, for their weigh-in. You know, gymnasts that are 42 kilos you know, getting ready to do, you know, do battle for a medal at the Olympics, just eating half bowls of rice and, and you know, still being able to physically um, to get there. And then I see people that are 180 kilos munching on a pizza and drinking a half litre of, of uh, sugary, syrupy drink. And I just think, I just feel, it just makes me sad that, that person is is may have issues, may have no education, may not know that what they're eating is actually bad for them. But if I steer you into our huge supermarket for a minute and you walk in and you're bombarded by some flowers and stuff on the left and the right and then you'll have troughs full of bananas and avocados and anything that's, that's in season usually that they're trying to push that the supermarket's buying huge volumes, which is great, and then there's usually a little dairy section with fresh milk and well, freshish milk and bread and things like that and a meat section and cheese section. And you go around the corner and a lot of the supermarkets now have a sushi counter, which is great, fresh sushi. And then you get into the soft drink aisle and then you get into the cookies aisle and then you get into the processed foods aisle and you're going, they should put warning signs on aisles three, four and five in all supermarkets. Enter with you know enter with care you are now entering a danger zone in your life mm -hmm. right the amount of food we eat out of the home the amount of packets we rip open every day and squeeze out a muesli bar which we think is healthy or you know consume a packet of cookies or or baked biscuits oh it's not fried it's baked it doesn't matter i would consider the worst food on the planet to be a donut which is made from refined flour, refined jam, refined sugar, and it's cooked in a refined oil. So nothing in there is fresh, lively, but to eat a donut is like, oh my God. And if it's got a fondant on it, more refined sugar, um, margarines, you know, things, um, things like that. But when you eat it, you go, oh my God, it's so delicious. Now, if you eat a donut once a week, once a month, twice a year, for a special thing, and you go, oh, I really feel like a donut. I mean, I do it myself sometimes, and I know what it's made of, and I know it's poison, but I still want to have one. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you go every morning for morning tea and buy your two sausage rolls and a donut and a, and a bottle of, you know, 14%, uh, when I say 14%, I'm talking about sugar, soft drink. I won't make any brands. Um, and you do that every day, well, I can tell you what, it's not doing any, you might as well go and smoke cigarettes. It's not doing any good for your health. Mm -hmm. So I think educating um, people, simple education. Now, I, I, and I go back to the, the bodybuilder. I'll buy four charcoal chickens. I'll take them home. I'll throw the legs and the thighs in the bin. I'll take the skin off and I'll wash the, the, the roast breast meat under hot water to get all the fat off. And then I'll eat those eight, roasted chicken breasts over the next 24 hours as my, my core source of protein because I'm getting ready for a show and I'm 105 kilos of lean, hard muscle and I need to look good when I do my, um, you know, my poses at the, uh, at the competition on next Saturday. And that's all I'll eat, right? So that, that was 20 years ago, that conversation I had, and it still resonates with me. 
and and that's at the fanatical end of I'm very educated and know that if I eat that I'm going to look good and blah blah blah. But again, that's just as bad as eating a pizza and a and a half liter of, of soda. So there's got to be that balance. So I talked before about do yourself a favor and cook one meal a week for yourself. Cook two meals a week for yourself. Three, four, five. Cook extra food so you can take it for your lunch tomorrow so you're not going to the to the cafe or or those sort of things. And then I'll I'll do one last simple example. So for breakfast today, let's say I'm having a healthy breakfast. So oh, I'll have an orange juice, beautiful healthy orange juice. I'll have a flavored yogurt. Again, what's bad about a flavored yogurt? And then I'll have a um, a, a granola. And I'll mix some of the yogurt with the granola. So I'm getting my muesli, I've got my yogurt, and I've got my juice. I'm going, how good is that? Now I can tell you that is probably the same thing as eating two donuts and a can of 14% sugary soft drink. Mm -hmm. The orange juice has had all the fiber taken out of it. It's probably the equivalent of eating three oranges of juice. It's It probably has maybe 14 or 15% sugar, maybe maybe four or five teaspoons of sugar. Wow. The flavoured yogurt, now the Greek yogurt on its own, mm -hmm. probably has one teaspoon of sugar. With the flavouring in it, add two or three teaspoons of sugar. So now I'm up to seven teaspoons of sugar, which is 28 grams, which is an ounce. And then I have my toasted muesli, which has got some honey on it, has some sugar in it, some fruits and things which has sugar in it. Maybe another three or four teaspoons of sugar. So I've had four, three, and three. What's that? Ten teaspoons of sugar in my healthy, what I consider, a normal person would consider, oh, I know I've got to skip in my step because I've had a healthy, healthy breakfast. So I've had 10 teaspoons or 40 grams of sugar. And I'm going to do that every day for 10 years until somebody says to me, you're... Uh, almost a diabetic. And I go, how can I be a diabetic? I don't eat sugar. I eat all these healthy foods every day. Yeah, but you're eating 10 teaspoons of sugar with your breakfast every day and you don't even know it. So read the food labels, number one, if you're eating processed food. Mm -hmm. Try to eat as much unprocessed food as possible. The, the guidelines in Australia is to eat five serves of fruit and vegetable a day which is the equivalent of five cups. So if you think uh, a measuring cup, so five of those. So if a measuring cup of spinach full, it's one serve. Peas, one serve. Onion, one serve. Whatever it is. An elite athlete goes for a minimum of nine serves of fruit and vegetables per day. But we're talking an elite athlete. We're talking someone who can run 100 metres in 9.6 seconds. You know, but... Ours is five, theirs is nine. Somewhere in the middle is probably about right. And what I've found is in a trend in the last few years is, is smoothies. So a lot of athletes now for breakfast will have a smoothie. We talk about frozen berries and things before. Yeah, frozen berries are cheap to buy. Great in a smoothie. And the darker the berry, the better as well because it has um, properties in there that are very, very good for your mental health and also for your digestion. And, and they're very high, high in fiber. So um, smoothies with raw yogurt, when I say raw yogurt, Greek yogurt, that is, has said no flavors added to it. Add the flavor with your, um, with your berries or your mango or your banana or, or, or whatever. If you want to add a bit of depth to it, a handful of oats as well. So what you've done is you've actually given yourself protein in the yogurt. You've given yourself a little bit of sugar with the berries and some carbs with the oats which is a very, very balanced. And you know what? You can drink it in the car on the way to work. So you haven't made, wasted any time sitting and eating. Protein is probably the most important thing to have for breakfast. It starts your metabolism off properly. And the other thing it does is it stops you becoming hungry. If you have a bowl of cereal or toast for breakfast, by 10.30, you've actually stimulated your metabolism the wrong way. Your pancreas is working. You're putting insulin into your body. And that's creating hunger. So if you're having protein, you're not doing that, and you, you're not you're not hungry for longer, which means you're not more likely to go to the coffee bar at ten thirty and have a donut, 
or something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so healthy eating, it's, it's not hard to do. You just have to be prepared to make the challenge and, and do it. Um, a guideline there would be always carry almonds with you. So if you're hungry, have 10 almonds or, or a small handful of almonds. Keep a little Ziploc bag in your, in your glove box or in your handbag or in your suit pocket or whatever. And if you're hungry, just have a few almonds. And you'd be surprised how, how further you can go and how much energy you have without going into sugary products. Mm. Yeah, that's a good little, it's got a bit of protein in it, a bit of fat in there, and um, it will keep you um, less hungry for longer. Okay. Drink lots of water, less processed food. Yes, I've definitely been known to eat um, muesli, muesli for breakfast with my yogurt and my coffee. Um, look, you, I'm not saying don't eat muesli, mm-hmm. but look at the label on it, how much sugar is in the product. I, I do look at that. And some of them, I, ca- I can't touch, mo- I don't touch most of the cereal aisle because it's so much sugar per 100 grams. Yeah, warning, warning, don't go into that aisle. Yeah. Avoid the aisle. Go to the fresh aisle mm-hmm. and and the um, and the frozen part mm-hmm. and the deli part, but stay away from the processed <laughs> things. I mean, sure, you need to get your soy sauce and your honey and all those sort of bits and pieces. But go and make a relationship with your butcher. Go to the butcher. Go to the seafood place. Go to your fresh fruit and vegetable mm-hmm. shop. Stay away from the supermarket. Those places are such a trap and we're bombarded with marketing. You know, wherever we go, there's signs. We go into a supermarket, make a list. How many times you make a list, you're going to buy 10 things, you have to take a trolley. You know, it's all temptation. But I can tell you it's like first in, first out. If you buy it, you will eat it. Yeah. If you buy it, you will eat it. So I'm not going to eat that packet of Oreos. Well, why are you buying it? Oh, maybe some people might come around and visit. Don't buy it. If you buy it, you will eat it. Mm. Okay, simple rule. Yep. Healthy eating starts with if you buy it, you will eat it. Same goes with the spinach. If you buy it, you'll eat it. That's it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then food wastage for me is, you know, um, I look, I don't know how to, to address it. I know in our kitchens we weigh any leftover food. We weigh um, and monitor what comes back on plates. So, you know, if we're serving you know, a type of vegetable and we notice that that day several of the plates come back with that vegetable sort of half eaten, we might talk to the chef and go, well, this, people aren't eating that. Like, let's not let's not put that on the plate anymore or let's look at the recipe. Maybe we can make it taste better or something like that. Um we buy a lot of food now from manufacturers, which is already trimmed, which takes off uh, because manufacturers can efficiently trim and then um, reuse the trim of, of vegetables. Like they can send it to farms and things like that, where a kitchen, a single use kitchen, um, hasn't got a lot of ability to, to sort of um, deco- you know, decompose uh, vegetable trimmings and things like that, where a manufacturer that's producing tons and tons of peelings can actually find a home for all that sort of stuff. Uh, when we did the, we did a university games in Taiwan and out of every, at the front of every restaurant, there was a blue bucket. And when the waiters cleared the table, they had to go out to the blue bucket and put the food scraps in the blue bucket. And then during the next day, the community service would pick up the blue buckets and put fresh ones. And that all went to farming. And, it, and they, there was no other way to get rid of food scraps because all, all waste was incinerated. And if you sent food scraps to the incinerator, you would get a fine. So all food waste was recycled, or 100% or maybe 95%. So we don't have any rules around food waste in this country. There is no penalty for wasting food in this country mm-hmm. or in any Western country. So... Remember three or four years ago when we used to go to the supermarket and get get plastic bags, and now we don't get plastic bags. Why did they? Why did that happen? Because the government mandated we won't use single use plastic bags, but the supermarkets let it happen because they then saved all that money on not giving free plastic bags. And guess what we did? We bought reusable plastic bags from the same supermarket, 
So they actually made money from it. So the only way this can work is that from farm to or paddock to plate, that all the people along the line can somehow make money out of um, not wasting food or reusing food or repurposing food or whatever it is. But um, it's got to start somewhere. And I think by talking about it, getting the message out there, making people more aware that um, you, know, you can eat leftovers. You know, children, all my children and all everyone's children out there, you don't have to call Uber Eats every time you're hungry, you know. Yeah. I mean, my, my, I've been accused of being part of the plastic bottle revolution that's contaminated the world. I don't think my father ever bought a plastic bottle. You know, I've, I've certainly had my fair share, but my generation mm -hmm. introduced pl bottled water to the world. And in some countries you need bottled water for sure. But in Australia, you don't need bottled water. And so I've been accused on several times of my generation. And I'm saying, well, your generation is responsible for um, home delivery and, and all that wastage and extra miles and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, every generation has a responsibility. But I think collectively, we all really need to have a good hard look at the impact and the, um, the CO2 emissions that we're creating in all of our acts. And you know, if one third of all of our food's been wasted, that's a, um, a serious impact, mm. especially with the population growth. Yeah. That's a lot of energy that's being spent on growing food that we won't even use. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And uh, you know, and not wanting to scare everyone, but fifty years ago, I think there was three billion people in the world. Now there's seven. In, 50, in thirty years' time, there'll be ten. And uh, if you think of the the destruction to the planet in the last 50 years and add that to the next 30, it's unsustainable. So, you know, all everyone listening to this show, if you have any feedback on how to save food and not waste food and and uh, and healthy eating tips, you know, I'd be happy to uh, happy to share with you. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and thank you for coming on the show. Um, I've learned so much um, today from... Um, you know, how to improve my own kitchen and how it runs. Um, and you've definitely got me thinking about how I can reduce um, how much food I, I produce or how much I throw away and definitely thinking about not getting Uber Eats tonight. <laughs> Fantastic. And remember, cooking's fun. You know, experiment. You know, you can create your own dish. Nobody owns the recipe but you. So, you know, have a bit of fun with it and uh, share with your friends and community. Great. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you. Great. You've been listening to On The House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.